Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is January 27th, 2010, and my guest is Larry White, professor of economics at George Mason University, and our topic is Hayek, and in particular, Hayek's view of the business cycle and of money. As listeners may know, film director John Popola and I have written a rap song about Keynes and Hayek, which we'll play at the very end of this interview, and you can watch the video at econstories.tv. Given the release of the video, I thought it'd be good to delve into the thought of Hayek a little deeper, and that's why Larry White is here. Larry, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. Good to be here. Let's start with the business cycle. What did Hayek see as the cause of the business cycle of the booms and the busts? Well, he had two scenarios. Uh, one was that the central bank just independently decided to uh, cheapen credit, expand the supply of loanable funds to use the Vixellian phrase, uh, drove the interest rate down, and that would uh, ignite an investment boom. Uh, the second scenario is a little more subtle. Uh, investors become more optimistic. They have some new technology that they want to invest in. They come to the banks and uh, want to borrow more money, and instead of uh, the banking system letting this increased demand for credit drive the interest rate up, The central bank then becomes involved by injecting enough credit to keep the interest rate from rising. So the first scenario is the supply of loanable funds shifts first. The second one is the demand shifts first, but then the central bank shifts the supply curve to keep up with the demand. To accommodate it. To accommodate it, to, as the real bills doctrine uh, used to put it, to uh, supply the needs of trade with uh, legitimate credit. But in either case, uh, Hayek argued, that's a bad idea because uh, it drives the market interest rate below the equilibrium or natural rate um, and creates a disequilibrium between the plans of savers and the plans of investors. Investors are trying to invest more resources than are really available in the economy. Uh, Consumers don't want to delay that much consumption. So let's take that first scenario, not the, uh, the second for now. So the Fed, either mistakenly or under political pressure, for whatever reason, artificially lowers interest rates. That does what in the real economy that causes uh, a problem? Well, if you think of uh, investors having uh, lots of different investment plans on their shelf that promise different rates of return, uh, the interest rate serves as a if you like, rationing device or as a benchmark that any investment plan has to clear before it's worth investing in. And as the interest rate goes down, more and more investment plans begin to look like they'll pay back enough to cover the cost of credit for that plan. So lots of investment plans come off the shelf. Uh, and that what is, is what increases the quantity of money that investors are demanding from the banks at a lower interest rate. In particular, Hayek emphasized... Uh, The investment projects that are the most interest-sensitive are the ones that are really going to uh, take off in the low-interest environment. And those are the investments that are really interest-sensitive are the ones that involve a lot of uh, time between the investment being made and the rewards being reaped. So our basic principle of finance is that you discount your cash flows uh, back to the present. And if the cash flows from the investment come many years into the future – then interest is a very powerful factor in determining whether it's worth doing. And if you can borrow just a little more cheaply, uh, long-term investment projects become particularly attractive. Now, this idea of – oh, let's – I want to come back to that, but let's continue the story. So some projects that normally wouldn't get undertaken get undertaken as a result of this artificially cheap credit. Right. And that sounds good. More investment. What's wrong with that? Well, there's only so much to be invested. There are only so many workers. There's only so much machinery. There are only so many raw materials. uh, And the economy needs to allocate them to the right kinds of investment projects. 
uh, Hayek's worry is that they get drawn away from sustainable, uh, appropriate investment projects into these more time-consuming, more elaborate investment projects uh, that aren't appropriate for the actual state of uh, demand in the economy, the, the time preferences of consumers. So the economy gets, if you like, top-heavy. It over-invests in roundabout production or in the early stages of, produ- of long production projects. And other parts of the pr- structure of production uh, start to languish, in particular shorter uh, payoff projects become starved for resources. And so that would just be a misallocation. That would normally we'd be worried about because it would mean that the pie would get as big as it could get. But that's not the end of the story. Right. So the these projects that uh, need a long time to come to fruition need continual uh, investments made in them. Right? They're you don't typically invest all the money at once and then just wait for the output. For the tree to grow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like you need to keep tending the tree or whatever the thing you're building. Um, so there are investment starts and then there are continued investments to bring the project uh, to fruition. Uh, and, and that's where the problem comes. The uh, As resources are expended to keep these uh, investment projects going – uh, they start to bid up the price of labor. They start to bid up the price of raw materials uh, and machines. And other businesses find th- their costs of production going up for those reasons. Um, and the ones that don't rely so heavily on cheap credit start to find that their uh, input prices are going up. And that's when the, uh, there's, there's a problem. There's not enough to go around. And at some point it becomes clear that there aren't enough genuine savings uh, to bring all these projects to fruition, and some of them are going to have to be uh, terminated. They're not going to make a profit. And that's going to lead to? That's going to lead to unemployment in those particular industries that made the wrong investments. So in the the last boom and bust, uh, it was the housing industry that particularly took off, and a sort of characteristic of a Hayekian uh, crisis is where you see half-finished investment projects being abandoned because uh, they can't be brought to fruition profitably. So you get half-built condominium neighborhoods on the outskirts of Las Vegas. But those were stopped because the interest rate changed and the funding changed, right? So in in the current situation, uh, in that housing uh, boom and bust, what we saw was – this is John Taylor's story. It's it's sometimes uh, – there's there's work by others on it where the artificially low interest rates of the 2002 to 2004 period uh, encouraged lots of borrowing and lots of housing construction when interest rates were quickly raised by Greenspan in the – I think it was 04 and 05. Those suddenly became less uh, profitable and many of them, of course, as you say, were abandoned. Right. But – I want to make sure I've got it straight. In the Hayekian story, does it require that adjustment in interest rates before this causes problems? Well, that's the usual symptom of there being uh, more investment than there are savings. Eventually, the interest rate gets bid up. In the case where the central bank is in the short run or in the immediate run controlling short-term interest rates, it comes through the news as the central bank deciding that it needs to raise interest rates. Because to keep interest rates low in an environment where prices are starting to rise means uh, accelerating the whole process, and uh, they don't want to let that get out of hand, then that's what precipitates the uh, interest rate rising. But really, they're bowing to the inevitable. I mean, the the scarcity of uh, investable resources is pushing the interest rate back up toward equilibrium. Wouldn't this also happen, and maybe this is part of that second story, wouldn't this happen in any industry where there's innovation? I mean, if we think about, uh, let's take the Fed out of it for the moment and talk about creative destruction generally, the idea that innovation and new ideas in the economy, and these are, this, of course, the term creative destruction comes from Schumpeter. Um, 
new ideas come along, new business comes along, as you, it does the same thing we, you just described. It draws resources away from other areas, and the, the price system is going to try to soften that transition. But, of course, there's imperfect information. It can't do it perfectly, despite the straw man version that we hear sometimes of a competitive economy. Uh, it's not instantaneous, those adjustments. Nobody is exactly sure what's going on in the whole economy. No one has that picture. So as a new sector springs up, say the auto industry at the turn of the 19th to 20th century or the internet uh, boom at the end of the 20th century, people are being drawn into this new profitable op- set of profitable opportunities. Some of them will turn out, of course, to be failures. Some of them will not realize their potential. So they weren't artificially induced by an artificially low interest rate. It's just that people were excited about a new area. There's uncertainty about what projects are going to be successful and which aren't going to be, which are going to be wildly profitable, which aren't. And take a wonderful example. Amazon was unprofitable for a long time, and people speculated that they might never be profitable. Well, they were wrong. It is profitable. But they didn't, no one knew that at the time. They were, of course, taking all kinds of resources to, for programming and web design and warehousing and all kinds of real resources that made it harder for other businesses to, to thrive. So comment on how Hayek saw that, if at all, differently from the experience of the interest rate-induced expansion. Well, that's a, a healthy kind of growth, and the, the test of whether it's healthy is whether, in fact, the projects do become profitable, whether they can repay the money they borrowed at the beginning. Uh, And that's fine. And if the economy, uh, because of new technology, say uh, the Internet, has a new set of investment projects um, that promise higher payoffs but far in the future, um, people will be willing to save, be willing to provide the resources for those projects if the promised payoff is a little bit higher than what they're getting from other investments now. So that kind of new demand for investable resources uh, bids up the interest rate if the central bank allows it to happen. And uh, Hayek referred to this as the interest rate break, uh, preventing the economy from overcommitting to these projects. Break, we, B-R-A-K- we do want, B-R-A-K-E. Right, like, like in a car. So we do want resources to go into these higher payoff projects, uh, but to bid them away from the current uses, the, the entrepreneurs need to pay a little more, um, <clears throat> and that's healthy. That, that brings about economic growth, and if the plans are correct, uh, they can pay it back. So that's a genuine growth uh, brought about by entrepreneurial innovation. <clears throat> the problem comes in what I was referring to earlier as a second scenario. If <clears throat> we don't let the interest rate rise, If the central bank decides that the interest rate ought not to rise in response to these new investment opportunities, but pumps in enough credit to make those investments and the old investments, then you get the danger of too many uh, investments of that kind being made. And some of them will nonetheless be profitable like Amazon, but, you know, pet.com didn't make it. Right. (laughs) Uh, So to prevent sort of too much piling in, the interest rate needs to rise to ration the uh, availability of resources to the new investments to what savers are voluntarily willing to provide. So let's go now to oh, – oh, before I forget, I want to ask one other uh, intermediate question. I mean, uh, another way of putting this is that very often and maybe even typically an overinvestment boom, a malinvestment boom kind of piggybacks on a genuine investment boom. It's just allowed to go too far because the central bank is too accommodating. I'm curious what influence the Austrian and Hayekian theories had, if any, on um, real business cycle theory and the time to build uh, work of Prescott and others. It's an area I don't know much about. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about it, Larry, so – Put you on the spot here, but no, uh, it, it it is a just, kind of, what is that work? Okay, describe that work briefly and talk about how it is different or similar to the story you just told. Well, there's a uh, an empirical uh, puzzle for monetary malinvestment theories, which is uh, the thought experiment usually begins with the central bank changes policy, makes the interest rate low, 
And so what should we see? We should see a burst of new investment starts. But the hard thing to explain is why higher investment persists even after the change in policy becomes evident to everybody. Uh, and so that's what the time to build model was supposed to explain. Why it isn't just an initial burst in new investment, which quickly decays, those, yeah. but, it, but one that persists. So time to build says you don't just invest all at once. You have to make continual investments to bring the project to fruition. Uh, an economist named Mike Montgomery at the University of Maine has actually written a couple of papers trying to apply this uh, modeling technique of Kidlin and Prescott to show that there's more mileage in the Austrian approach. Uh, some people have dis, uh, disrespected, I don't know what the verb I'm looking for, <laughs> said there's it's a, problem for, it's a problem for the Austrian approach that it depends on investment being very intrasensitive but it doesn't look that interest sensitive. Uh, and he shows that if you take account of the time to build propagation mechanism, that it fits the story better. Uh, right? So some of the investment we see today was really committed to a while ago when interest rates were low, but people are trying to bring the project to fruition. Sometimes it's called, uh, and sometimes it's very difficult if the interest rate has gone up by that point. So you sometimes hear references to distress borrowing. Mm -hmm. But at some point, some projects have to be abandoned if there isn't enough to go around. One thing I struggle with, and I don't, again, I don't have a good enough understanding of this, but one thing I struggle with is the role expectations play in these stories. Um, you know, when the, Federal, when the Federal Reserve plays with the short-term interest rate and it goes down, and the episode where we're talking about in the current crisis, uh, 2002 to 2004, is quite a was low for quite a long time. It's an, an unusually long time for the rates to be held at 1%. Negative in real terms yeah. for a couple of years. Um, but most people expect those rates to go back up at some point. So if I'm planning a long-term investment, let's say it, with this time to build or um, this delayed ongoing investment that I'm going to have to do – so let's let's take an example. It's not so much building a house, which I can usually do in under a year, but I'm going to create a, a, an Amazon. I'm going to have to build warehouses or rent them. I'm going to have to accumulate stock. I'm going to have to design software that's going to allow all these things to happen. I've got to advertise. And I'm going to be, as you say, pumping money in continually over a fairly long period of time. Why would I respond to a short-run interest rate signal that are, say, interest rates are low, when I would reasonably expect, forget rational expectations, that I might, but I would reasonably expect that, that that's not going to persist and I have this long-term investment. So wouldn't, I be, wouldn't, that, wouldn't it be surprising for short-run short changes in interest rates to generate these large, long-lived projects? That's a good question, and it's one that uh, has to be answered to make sense of Hayek's theory. Uh, I think the answer is that if everybody had perfect expectations, if everybody had perfect foresight about the path of interest rates, you wouldn't see this kind of cycle. Uh, and it doesn't require that everybody guesses wrong. It just requires that too many people guess wrong about the future path of interest rates in order to get enough malinvestment to cause a problem. What I was saying earlier was that uh, often the uh, malinvestments uh, piggybacked on sustainable investments. And so they're often, people are uh, convinced that this is a new era, right? There's a book out now called This Time is Different right. by Rogoff and Reinhardt. Yeah, we interviewed Reinhardt uh, for the program. And so, ago. and sometimes the, the Fed has encouraged that idea, right? Greenspan talked about there being a new economy right. in, in the midst of the dot-com boom. Uh, there was so, supposed to be sort of permanent productivity growth uh, ever higher, ever higher. Product, or, yeah. <laughs> so, if some people are taken in by that kind of thinking, then uh, you can get the problem. Um, it's so. It, there's no doubt. There's a there's a wide distribution of savviness right, in and the there's, economy. There's uncertainty about how long. Even if people generally recognize that these rates are lower than historical uh, average and there's probably at some point they're going to go up a bit. There can be differences of opinion about how soon and how much. Uh, people want to make their money now and get out at exactly the right time, but they may 
overestimate how long the money's going to stay cheap. Um, and of course, there's political pressure to keep it cheap. I and mean, right now we're at very, very, very low interest rates, but they're very artificially low through actions of the Fed and government programs, for example, to keep mortgage rates low. So uh, it's, yeah, there, there's a lot of weird stuff going on. There's a big spread right now between short-term interest rates and long-term interest rates. And in that kind of environment, although you would avoid getting caught out if you locked in all your money long-term for your long-term investment project, it's very tempting to borrow short because it's so much cheaper and then roll over the debt. And that's when people get caught out. Yeah, the U.S. So government They take doing, a risk, they get caught. Government's doing that too, by the way, right now. Well, uh, actually, actually, I like the government to only borrow short because then they have an in- incentive not to promote inflation. Oh, well, that's interesting. <laughs> Because Because they have to refinance their debt at higher interest rates if they start pushing rates up. Um, Let's turn to the – a little bit of economic history. Um, What story did Hayek tell uh, his – if I'm correct, his most important book on this was Prices and Production, uh, the story that we're talking about, which came out I think in 1931. Is that correct? 1931, that's right. So – what – did he have a story to tell for what started the Great Depression? Well, that was his story. Uh, his story was that the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England had injected credit during the 20s and built up a credit bubble basically. Uh, and they had injected money in an environment of rising productivity of a, a genuine uh, period of high growth in the economy in order to keep uh, the price level from falling. So they were stabilizationists, or they were inspired by stabilizationist ideas, meaning that the price level ought to be stabilized. And Hayek in, insisted, and he said in the foreword to Prices in Production, uh, for several years now, I've been arguing against the stabilizationists. I'm sorry, that, that was actually in 1933 he said that, not in Prices in Production. But Prices in Production was part of this argument against a policy of trying to stabilize the price level. Because in an environment of growing output, it requires injecting credit uh, to keep the price level from falling. And that injection of credit distorts the interest rate, and that causes the problem. So he criticized uh, earlier economists who thought that if the price level was flat, then everything must be fine. He said that's not the indicator you want to look at. You want to look at relative prices. You want to look at the proportions between early-stage investment and late-stage investment. You need to look at the structure of production. And so he wrote that in 1931. So that was his explanation for the upper turning point, if you like, why the boom of the 20s couldn't last, why there had to be a downturn. And he probably looked pretty good at that point. Yeah, attracted a lot of followers. And something went wrong because by, I don't know, the 40s, certainly he was out of favor as a macroeconomist. And I'd say the Austrian business cycle theory was neglected and almost forgotten by the economics profession. So what was the reason? Well, uh, Another guy came along. Uh, yeah, what's what's uh, his name? Keynes. Um, Keynes, 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 that's Keynes, it. Yeah. yeah. So Keynes came along. And of course, uh, Hayek was not the only Austrian who was troubled by Keynes' ascendance uh, into the macroeconomic stratosphere. Schumpeter also uh, was very uh, resentful that his insights into the business cycle didn't uh, get sustained. Interestingly, both of them, Hayek and Schumpeter, are remembered fondly by by other economists and still occasionally read. I'd like to see them read more, but their work on microeconomics, ironically, is is still, I think, very well respected. It's their macro stuff that, that got put uh, on the shelf. What happened? Well, events uh, kept moving forward, and – Hayek had, I think, arguably, a good explanation for the downturn. He didn't have such a good explanation for why the economy continued to deteriorate after 31, uh, continued to go down, and stayed down for so long. Uh, Now, he actually had a prescription for what to do about it. In Prices in Production, he says, uh, the central bank, assuming we have one, should stay which we did at the time. Which we did at the time, sure, and they were calling the shots. Uh, should try to stabilize uh, the money stream, he called it, in sort of modern terms we would say a nominal GDP. 
or in terms of the equation of exchange, M times V, not just the stock of money, but multiplied by the number of times it's turning over. That's V, the velocity. That's velocity of money. So if people are hoarding money, inject more money, uh, if the money supply is shrinking as it was from 30 to 33, have the central bank offset that. Uh, that, of course, is also Milton Friedman's advice. Uh, but Hayek didn't make that advice based on his own norm for monetary policy. And he later apologized for it and said, well, I had this fond wish that a little bit of deflation uh, would help break the rigidity of prices and wages and restore a more flexibly functioning economy. I should have realized even then that was a, a pipe dream. But uh, so Hayek did not call for central banks to do what on his own theory they ought to have been doing, which was keep spending from continuing a downward spiral. Other Austrians offered what they called a theory of the secondary deflation. So this was kind of overkill, having the economy go through this deflationary spiral. Uh, Hayek should have spoken out more against it. Uh, uh, he, he didn't do so. So he was viewed as having sort of nothing useful to say about how to stop the deterioration of the economy. Even if he had been right about why it started, now we need to worry about how to stop it from continuing because it's clearly gone way beyond what was necessary to clear out the malinvestments of the 20s. Um, and in that kind of environment, uh, as Milton Friedman has said, uh, Hayek's uh, picture of events was regarded as being very gloomy and very nothing we can do. You just have to let uh, the economy purge the problems out of the system uh, in the most painful way possible. Uh, and so when Keynes came along, it was regarded as a message of hope. Here's something we can do. We don't have to just sit by uh, and linger in the depression. There's something active we can do. Kind of remarkable, actually, given that we had that same hopeful message a year ago with the stimulus package that was passed. And, of course, you can always debate as to – I mean, whether it would have been even worse had the stimulus package not passed, it certainly hasn't gotten better. And yet that hopeful message uh, just keeps selling. It's just <laughs> – it's hard to hard, – it's hard to turn your back on. Well, and the, the idea – Because we have to do something. The idea that fiscal policy, that playing around with government spending and taxes uh, has a big effect, has kind of enjoyed a comeback. I thought it was dead. Yep. I thought we – the evidence showed that it was too little too late typically – uh, or it doesn't really have any effect, even no matter when it comes. Uh, it's mostly offset by changes in private sector spending, but it seems to have made a comeback. And and I guess the reason it's made a comeback is the view that, well, the Fed is out of bullets, right? Interest rates yeah. can't go any lower, so they, they can't do any more. Uh, but I think that's wrong, and I think some economists have sort of rediscovered this uh, idea that you know, monetary policy really still is the thing that's ruling uh, the behavior of the economy. And if we had prevented the deflation, or the, I shouldn't say deflation, if we had prevented the shrinkage in nominal GDP, the recession would have been milder. Uh, Scott Sumner has been pushing that sure. argument. Yeah, and we interviewed him a couple of weeks ago, and he definitely uh, makes that claim. I, I find it fascinating how difficult it is to um, – no, whether that's right or not. Uh, well, but you, you can't <laughs> you can't eliminate recessions that way because there were real malinvestments. When those are written down, uh, real income has to decline as in, resources are unemployed temporarily until they find more sustainable uses. So it's not going to prevent a, a recession in real terms, but you don't want to exacerbate it. You don't want it to be more punishing than necessary by making it, say, hard for people to repay their debts because nominal income is shrinking. Well, let's turn to money. We've been talking about what the Fed has done wrong. Um, what should the Fed do uh, to get it right? If we wanted to avoid these booms and busts, uh, what's the – under? let's start with Hayek, and then I want to turn to what Larry White has to say about it. Okay. But what did Hayek <laughs> say about what the Fed should be doing? Well, Hayek had uh, talked about the issue on various levels uh, when he took for granted that you have a central bank issuing fiat money uh, and asked what's the sort of most neutral monetary policy they can pursue, what's going to do the least damage to the economy. Uh, he was always a strong opponent of inflation. Uh, 
against the idea that you could stimulate the economy in any useful way by uh, cheap money. Uh, but he suggested uh, early on, as I, I said, uh, trying to stabilize the nominal spending flow in the economy, nominal GDP. In uh, the Constitution of Liberty, he later said, well, maybe a shorthand way of doing that would be to try to stabilize an index of wholesale prices. He still didn't want to stabilize consumer prices because of the problem he pointed to in the 20s, that if you do that, then you're injecting more credit when productivity is high, uh, and that can cause a credit bubble. But if you focus on input prices, um, then the relationship between consumer prices and input prices can change without the central bank trying to offset that. Uh, so if, if there's a growth in productivity with stable input prices, output prices can fall relative to input prices without triggering injections of credit. So that was what he proposed in the Constitution of Liberty. Uh, now, as the uh, 70s went on and inflation got out of hand, Hayek started thinking again more fundamentally, uh, as he had at times during the 30s, about the institutional arrangement and not what should the Fed do, but uh, is there something, some kind of institutional arrangement, some regime change that would give us better performance than we're getting from central banks? And, of course, he famously uh, published a pamphlet in 1976 called Choice in Currency where he said, well, to protect themselves against inflation, people ought to at least be free to use whatever currency from anywhere in the world they find more stable. That would put a, a damper on the inflationary proclivities of any one central bank. And then he just pushed it a little farther <laughs> and said, why don't we let private firms into this competition and published a monograph called The Denationalization of Money. Which I think is available on the web. For, it is uh, at for, the for, IEA, no charge at IEA. dot co. dot uk yeah, or I'll org. Put a, we'll put a web. I'll link up to it. Uh, right. So denationalization of money argues against the presumption that government has to provide money, and imagines what it would look like if private firms were providing uh, an fiat type money. That is a money that's not based on gold and silver, but based on the. Uh, well, the, the promises, I guess, uh, of these issuers, private issuers, private banks, that they would keep the value stable. And Hayek wants to argue that they would be more reliable than central banks have been. It's easier to hold private firms to their promises than it is to hold central banks to their promises. I'll put this in a little bit of historical context. You know, For those of us under the age of 50 living in the United States um, – I shouldn't say those of us. I'm a little over 50. But if you're in your 50s or younger – um, the worst inflationary episode in our lifetime was the 70s uh, when inflation reached, uh, what, 12-ish? 13.3% in 1979. You. Okay. Uh, so that was uh, – that scared a lot of people. And in our – in the last year or two, there's been some question of whether we've actually had deflation. If we had, it's, it was very mild. And maybe we can talk about deflation a little bit in a minute. But for somebody like Hayek – and others who lived uh, through the 20s and 30s, they had seen hyperinflation, not just in Zimbabwe, which we read about in the paper here in America, but in many of the nations of Europe, and in particular in Germany in the, in the aftermath of World War I, which led to horrific uh, political consequences, uh, partly leading to the rise of Hitler, uh, which I'm sure uh, Hayek watched with some dismay. So – this was – the fear of inflation must have been very different for that generation than it is than it is for us in the abstract. Do you think that's true? This has something to do – you know, for example, I know that, that Hayek in his correspondence with Keynes was very uneasy about the threat of inflation in the, in the 40s um, and, and was very – the word I would use is vigilant, that this, this uh, creature had to be contained – is that is that a do you think that's relevant? I think that's right. And uh under the institution of the gold standard, uh which prevailed, you know, for the early part of Hayek's life, there's no tendency toward uh, a rising price level. In fact, in an economy uh with growing output, you often have periods of mild deflation. That is output grows a little faster than the stock of gold, which tends to grow pretty slowly. So uh, 
anything above zero in the price level is uh, cause for concern. But Hayek wanted to argue that even if the price level, consumer prices aren't rising, you need to look behind the scenes and see whether credit is being injected to prevent prices from falling. In that case, you have a problem building. Uh, so he was not only concerned about uh, the consumer price index, but sort of what was behind it. He was concerned about excess growth in central bank credit. So let's turn to that denational. Oh, I, I should also say in the 70s, inflation and in consumer price index, inflation in Great Britain was in the 20s, so even much higher than in the U.S. Right, which was starting to be at a, a very alarming level. Um, well, let's turn to the denationalization of money, and, and why don't you talk about um, – First, we'll talk about Hayek, and then we'll, we'll get to Larry White. I mean, if Hayek was proposing a private money supply, what would be the implications for his story of the interest rate as um, coordinating the plans of savers and investors? What would be the interest rate path, the path of inflation uh, under a denationalized money in Hayek's view? Did he have a story about that? Uh, I've written actually about this <clears throat> because there's something that troubles me about the, the denationalization of money, which is uh, Hayek seems to switch toward favoring st stability in the consumer price index, mm -hmm. which is contrary to what he had believed his entire career. Right? His argument was that trying to stabilize the consumer price index is what led to the bubble building up in the 20s, and so it's his explanation for the crash. Uh, in 1929. But in denationalization of money, he says, well, I imagine that these uh, private money issuers would most appeal to the public if they promised stable prices. And then he has a little footnote, uh, stable consumer prices. He has a little footnote in which he says, yes, yes, I'm, I'm among those who pointed out that this could be a problem, uh, but I no longer think it's a problem of much practical relevance. Uh, so I have trouble making sense of that <laughs> statement that it's no longer a problem of practical relevance. Um, <clears throat> but he's, I think what he's saying is when you're talking about central banks creating problems of 25% inflation, that's a much bigger practical problem um, than the malinvestment that's caused by a stable price a stable level, price level yeah. uh, money growth sufficient to create a stable price level. I want to go back to 1931 or 32 for a minute because I, I wanted to ask you a question about that, and I, I got uh, we went off on a different path. It seems to me, so you you mentioned that we're talking about why Hayek's ideas and the Austrians in general fell out of favor in macroeconomics, and we talked that he had a, one answer was he had a gloomy story, uh, which was waited out, and of course waiting it out seemed to take a very long time, and that I, of course discouraged people from taking him seriously. Others have argued that, well, the reason it took a long time wasn't Hayek's fault. There was regime uncertainty. Uh, Bob Higgs has argued that, I think, pretty uh, – has a lot of interesting things to say about it, meaning that Roosevelt was frantically intervening in all kinds of complex ways with the price system and with the rules of the game for property rights. So, of course, private investment takes this horrible tumble in the 30s. Of course, it could be for other reasons as well. We don't know. I think that's right. I don't think Hayek's story explains the length and depth of the Great Depression. For that, I think we need to add in these stories uh, like Higgs's about regime uncertainty, Milton Friedman's about the money supply actually collapsing, causing an excess demand for money and unsatisfied people trying to build up their money balances by not spending is bad for business, and it takes a while for prices and wages to adjust to the shrunken money supply. Uh, but not just uncertainty about what Roosevelt was going to do. What Roosevelt actually did in the National uh, Industrial Recovery Act and the Agricultural Adjustment Act, right? they actually organized industry and agriculture to restrict output. Um, in the name of raising prices. In the name of raising prices high, and thereby yeah. restoring profits and thereby restoring yeah. prosperity. But there's a non sequitur there. You can't. You can make one industry more profitable by cartelizing it and restricting its output. It gets monopoly profits. But you can't do that for everybody because it only works by restricting output. If everybody's restricting output, 
then total output is shrinking. Even worse, yeah. <laughs> Industries that are restricting output are not going to be hiring more workers or putting more machines into use. They're going to be cutting back on all those things. Yeah, that's a very uh, strange idea that somehow has still has some life of its own. It's hard to believe. But what I was going to say, and this may sound um, – sounds a little bit scary, but I'll say it anyway. It seems to me that that there's a piece of Keynes – that is fruitfully tied into the story of Hayek, which is the following, which I thought of as you were talking about um, uh, the collapse of, of nominal spending. The role of animal spirits, in which I'll, I'll call psychology or fear of the, of the future or uncertainty or whatever you want to call it. That's my understanding of what Keynes called animal spirits. I believe there's a reference to those in the rap video we're about to hear. Yeah, there is. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think Keynes, although I think Keynes was wrong in that that was a fruitful way to talk about what causes business cycles, it certainly is a part of what makes it difficult to cope with them. So, for example, uh, now earlier you talked about what you call the equation of exchange. So we've referenced this once or twice before. The idea is, and this comes from Irving Fisher, I think, that MV, he certainly popularized it. Yeah, that MV equals PT. That is the amount of money times the number of times it turns over. So gets, that's total spending. That's total spending equals real economic activity, which equals is Equals total T. income. That's to just an accounting identity. So PT is price times quantity. T is transactions. Right. So if V is tumbling – if the velocity of money is talking about that people is – People are hoarding money. People are holding on – not spending at the rate that they used to because they're anxious. There's – so in other words, this isn't – I don't think this spontaneously occurs. It occurs because somebody's messed up probably in the policy area like the Fed's policy. And and so now people are saying, oh my gosh, uh, I don't know how things are going to go for a while. I think I'll just be a little more cautious. Um, that's hard to measure. Uh, the, the The central bank doesn't – you know, has no real handle on that. You can't – you don't know how severe it is. Sure, you understand that there's some contraction there, but you don't understand how severe it is. You can't precisely measure it. So offsetting that with M That's right. is really going to be an inherently difficult thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do in a timely manner, in the right size. And that was why Milton Friedman said central banks have done a bad job of it and shouldn't even try, should just target uh, – the monetary aggregate, not worry about. Just M. Just, just let M. it grow at a slow, steady rate of 3%, say, is what he advocated, I think. And, and that advice is fine as long as velocity is reasonably stable. But it's a problem when velocity is unstable. Right. Now, one argument would be, well, velocity is stable as long as the government doesn't mess around with M. So if M is going at 3%, then V will be responding to whatever psychology there is in human beings about the future and the present and their desire to save versus consume. Well, the and, cost of holding money as opposed to earning interest on it. Yeah, so all that would, would be pretty, presumably pretty stable. But once the government starts monkeying around with M and leading to some of the problems we talked about, then sure, there's going to be some V swings <laughs> that make the whole enterprise wildly unstable. And that part, I think... Keynes was, quote, right about uh, that, that there is a problem. I, I don't see it as the problem that's the start of the problem, but it certainly makes any attempt to tell a story about the – or to t create policy to fix things makes it difficult. So you could be stuck in 1933 uh, with a an economy that's – that it's at its, its nadir, its lowest point with 25 percent unemployment and real output way down and not really have a good answer as to what to do course, whether you're a Hayekian or a Keynesian. Yeah, if... Cause, and I, let me and, say this a different way, because yeah. the government, I think it's the problem we're in right now, the, the single obvious thing the government needs to do is to create more confidence about the future, and that's the one thing that economists, psychologists, and policymakers know very little about. <laughs> and so we get a new plan every week for yeah. how to do that. Yeah, <laughs> which makes <laughs> which it... Which tends to undermine <laughs> a confidence the ability in the to plan in the future, yeah. for the future, that's right. Okay, so uh, yeah, so there are two problems. One that, that uh, is people trying to hang on to their money and not spend it because they don't know what's coming, and more generally, uh, investors are going to put off launching new projects uh, until it becomes clear uh, what the environment's going to be, and 
creating uncertainty in the tax environment doesn't help. That just makes the problem worse. Yeah. Well, let's turn to your ideas. So, on- but I, but I, th- I think I agree with you that once the central bank and the treasury and whoever else has made the policy that's dug us into a deep hole have uh, done that, it's not easy to climb out. Uh, there isn't any magic bullet for doing that, but we need to put uh, stable policies in place to allow people to start planning for the future again. Yeah. Which is an argument for doing nothing, which is risky politically and even for economists in well, 1930. I, I call it an argument for the rule of law. <laughs> yeah. No, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. But we have to do something only if it makes it better, would seem to be to be a, uh, the next part of that sentence. Um, well, let, let's turn to your ideas and your work on on money and the institutions that might lead to a, a better uh, world. What do you think we ought to be doing with the money supply and what is the role for the Fed, if any? What do you advocate? Well, I have a, a kind of first best idea, which I, I'm not uh, – imagining will happen anytime soon or advocating be implemented before uh, people are ready for it. But I've written about the monetary systems based on a gold or silver standard in which banks uh, compete to issue currency, uh, traditionally been known as a free banking system, and which there is no central bank, uh, but rather all kinds of money are provided by private institutions and the private institutions uh, discipline each other. Uh, any one bank that issues more money than its customers want to hold will find the money returning to it for redemption, uh, and it'll be losing reserves to the other banks. So it's a system based on s- redemption in some kind of basic money. Traditionally, it was gold and silver that the banks themselves don't issue, so it acts as a constraint on them. And the constraint is made immediately binding by the banking system, a competitive banking system as a whole. Well, let's talk about that redemption for a minute because I don't understand that. Um, Would the redemption process be mandated by law or would it emerge through the competitive process? It would be part of the contract that banks have with their customers. So emerges through the competitive process. So I I mean we have something like it today where – your checking account is redeemable in Federal Reserve notes. Federal Reserve notes are the basic money, right? So you can go to your bank and empty out your bank account. If uh, That's my deal with the bank. That's your deal with the bank. And you wouldn't open an account at a bank that didn't promise to let you do that whenever you wanted. So in the old days, people did that with uh, bank accounts. But the basic money was gold or silver coins, and so that's what banks had to promise to deliver when people wanted it. Uh, Mostly people open accounts so they can pay each other, so they can write checks. And so banks have to make good at the clearinghouse on the checks that their customers have written to people that have deposited those checks in other banks. The other banks come back with the checks and say, we just credited our customer with $50 because your customer said uh, he was transferring that money. Now we need to get it from you. So that's the clearinghouse. And banks are always transferring reserves uh, to each other. And that's where this constraint is most immediately felt. And how many – what would be the amount of reserves that a bank would hold to engender my confidence in this world? Well, there isn't any uh, sort of a priori answer to that question. The bank has to figure out what reserves it needs to hold in order to immediately meet all the redemption demands it uh, has to meet at the end of the business day uh, at the clearinghouse. So empirically, banks need to figure this out. It's a practical problem, but as Mises used to say, that's what bankers are good at, <laughs> solving this kind of statistical problem. Uh, historically, banks in the early days when reserves were hard to replenish, it was hard to get a shipment of gold from somewhere else, banks would hold 30 40 percent reserves. As transportation improved, as railroads were built, as banks became more sophisticated about, sophisticated about managing uh, their assets – Bank reserves, some gold and silver reserves sometimes went down to 2%. Uh, now, those weren't the only resources banks had, right? They had very liquid assets that they could sell in order to get more reserves. Any particular bank would have 
commercial paper or government bonds that it could sell very quickly uh, to replenish its reserves. But banks were very vigilant about making sure they met all the redemption demands that uh, came to them. But in those days, and what period of time were we talking about? So the period I've written about most is uh, Scotland between 1720 and 1845. That's a very long time. So that was a long trial. Canada had a fairly free banking system up to the Bank of Canada Act in 1935. So there's lots of uh, historical experience with this, these kinds of systems. There was a book uh, edited by Kevin Dowd entitled The Experience of Free Banking, which collected a dozen or so case studies. But in those times, there were still runs on banks. Um, and what about the stability of the economy as a whole? I mean, a lot of people argue that those of us who would like to see more competition in the supply of money or who criticize the Fed, their answer is always, yeah, but before the Fed, Fed was established in 1913, before the Fed, we had recessions, depressions, we had all kinds of problems. In fact, many of them were horrible. So even if you put the current crisis at the Fed's doorstep and the 1933 uh, and the 1929 Great Depression, those are two really bad episodes to put at their doorstep. But but there, it wasn't all paradise before that. That's the standard answer. So what, what do we know in the historical record about how free banking might um, be more or less stable than the current regime. Bank runs and uh, financial panics were a problem in the United States in the late 19th century, but it, and they've been taken as sort of the number one rationale for central banking, and when central banking didn't solve the panic for deposit insurance uh, in the 30s. But if you look around the world, if you don't just look at the U.S., you find that bank runs and financial panics are actually pretty rare. So they don't seem to be an inevitable consequence of having uh, a fractional reserve competitive banking system. They're much more common in the U.S. than in Canada, where there are no financial panics. They're much more common in England than uh, than in Scotland. Uh, And so you begin to think, well, if you want a stable banking system... Uh, maybe it has something to do with the way banks are regulated. And so the the instability of banking in the U.S., uh, and I'm certainly not the first one to come up with this diagnosis, uh, is due to the peculiar regulations on U.S. banks uh, in the late 19th century. In particular, U.S. banks were not allowed to branch out, uh, never across state lines, and very often not even within states. That meant the banks were undercapitalized, underdiversified, uh, and secondly, there were restrictions on banks' ability to meet shifts in the public's desire to hold currency rather than deposits. So they, there was a problem known as the inelasticity of the currency. There was a ceiling, uh, practically speaking, on the amount of banknotes a bank could issue set by the National Bank Acts, National Banking Acts. So the panics uh, have a history. They typically begin in the fall. Uh, And what happens is farmers come to the bank and say, I I need to pay my farm workers. They don't have bank accounts, so I can't write them checks. I need currency. I need banknotes. And the banks would say, "Uh, we're not allowed to issue any more banknotes. And the farmer says, well, you still have to give me currency. You have to let me redeem my deposit. So I'll take silver coins or I'll take greenbacks, uh, which were government-issued money that served as bank reserves. So a problem the banks could have solved by – changing the form of their liabilities between deposits and notes turns into a reserve drain. The country banks then start pulling reserves out of the cities. The other cities start pulling money out of New York, and now we've got a panic. Uh, And that's the story of the 19th century panics. In countries that didn't have those kind of legal restrictions on banks, you didn't find those events. So it was created by our regulation. It wasn't a natural weakness of the banking system. Why do you think the Fed was created? Well, so the Fed was created to solve these panic problems, uh, but there was another way to do it. The other way to do it would would have been to deregulate. And there were people in the U.S. who said, hey, look at Canada. They don't have these problems. Why don't we emulate Canada? And that kind of reform was blocked by the small banking lobby, basically. They said, hey, Canada has nationwide branching of banks. If we allow that, my neighborhood is going to be invaded by banks that are better run than mine. I can't allow that. And, of course, 
small banking lobby, it's, it's hard to remember, was very powerful. It wasn't until 1995 that banks got the right to branch across state lines uh, in the U.S. Yeah, that, that's hard to remember. And, of course, in some states, you couldn't branch within the state. That's right. You had unit banking. Yeah. Um, I remember being a graduate student in Chicago. You could have a branch in Illinois if it was within a – like something like – You were allowed to have two drive-up windows in Illinois. At, at the at, – Within a certain radius of the main office. Right, but it, and it was something like – a quarter of a mile. So I remember bank. I, I had a bank that had two branches, but they were within <laughs> a few hundred yards of each other. It was not that exciting. Um, it was a strange, anti-competitive, government-imposed system. Illinois was a, a very problem state, and Texas, of course, had nothing but unit banks, and two-thirds of the banks failed when the price of oil went down because they were not diversified outside Texas. All their loans were – or almost all their loans – too many of their loans were to oil-related industry or real estate. I would suspect that part of this problem, uh, you know, it, it, part of the political problem is the seeming unfairness of losing all your money in a bank that you've put all, you put all your money in one basket, your eggs in one basket. You've put all your savings in a bank. There's a run on the bank. Maybe it's rare, but the effect on you, it, in other words, I mean, let me say it a little more clearly. Most of the time in America, in American history, we let bad decisions yield bad consequences. So you make a lousy car, your car company goes out of business. You make a lousy product, you lose your money. If you run your bank badly, you know, normally we'd say, well, you, well that's life. You, you go out of business. But if it imposes a very large cost on a small group of identifiable individuals, the uh, political demand for FDIC must have been – Part of the story as to why people wanted to get the government into the banking business and, and not using those other solutions. Well, the surprising thing is how long it took to get federal deposit insurance. And at the time it passed, it passed by the thinnest of legislative margins. And FDR was actually against yeah, it. Yeah, he was governor of New York, right? He, he and because everybody it. had seen deposit insurance at the state level where it almost inevitably went broke. Right? It encouraged too much bad banking, and so the deposit insurance fund just ran out of money paying out to depositors of failed banks. Um, and so it wasn't actually a very popular idea at the federal level. But there is a difference, which is the FDIC has the backing of the Federal Reserve. They can always borrow money, and print the Fed it. can always print it. Yeah, yeah FDR is a letter uh, – I've actually seen it. Uh, it was a letter he wrote. Letter the editor he wrote of to I forget New York paper I don't think I'm not sure it was the Times I'll try to find a reference to it where he basically said you know FDIC the equivalent at the time which was proposed which he opposed is an absurd idea because of moral hazard he didn't use that phrase but he said if every bank knows it's going to get its deposits always guaranteed it's going to make reckless investments and this was he was a, on to something this was <laughs> this was the argument that most large banks made at the time. Uh, but the proponents of deposit insurance at the time were small banks that said people think we're weak. And of course we are. <laughs> but if we can look just as solid as the big banks, people will stop withdrawing their money from us and putting it in the sounder banks. So this is a great idea. This will even the playing field between us and the big banks. And that was another triumph for the small bank lobby yeah, that they got it through. Incredible. But I, I was going to say there – if a problem arises from bank runs, uh, there is a way for banks to anticipate and build in a contractual circuit breaker into their deposit contracts. It's known as a notice of withdrawal clause. And uh, trust companies and savings banks in the U.S. traditionally had this uh, before federal deposit insurance. So what it said was, uh, in the event we need to, we can tell you that you need to give us 60 or 90 days notice before you withdraw your money. And, of course, you wouldn't want the bank to invoke that clause on you, but you would if the alternative was everybody else in the bank empties it before you get there. For sure. You'd like them to invoke that clause on the other depositors. Yeah. So it's in your interest to have that clause in all the deposit accounts if it really is a problem. And the 90 days gives the bank time, pr provided it's – prudently managed to sell off some of its more liquid assets to come up with enough reserves to pay everybody without having to 
you know, dump unsaleable assets on the market for pennies on the dollar. So it avoids the problem that's commonly known as fire sale losses. And so that's a way to, to handle it if there is a problem. But historical research on bank runs indicates that the reason people run is not fear of other people running. People typically ran when the bank was already insolvent. And so it actually served a healthy purpose of closing the bank before it lost even more money. And it's true, the losses were unevenly distributed depending on whether when you were you at the front that, of the line or yeah. the back of the line. Yeah. So, yeah, that's... Um, but in a way, that provides a useful incentive mechanism for making sure that you monitor your bank and don't rely on other people to monitor it for you. Yeah. Um, and so we say, well, we'll just have the government monitor it. And that way I can sleep at night unless, of course... They monitor it badly, and I go. Bro- it goes broke. And- there's another. <laughs> there's another contractual mechanism we don't think much about today, and that is uh, extended liability for bank shareholders. So, in the Scottish free banking era, uh, bank shareholders had unlimited liability, meaning if the bank uh, assets declined in value, if the bank had bad loans or uh, couldn't repay its depositors, then a letter would go out to the shareholders saying, uh, "You have to chip in another fifty pounds to make good on the debts of the bank." And so banks did fail because they were badly managed, but the depositors didn't end up losing any money. It was the shareholders. You know, I always knew Scotland was – I mean, they've got great poetry, great uh, fly fishing, great <laughs> single malt scotch, and now it turns out they have the right model for how we ought to – Well, Adam, Adam, Smith, Adam Smith wrote about how great the uh, Scottish banking system was uh, – didn't see any problem that uh, justified having a government monopoly bank like the Bank of England, which he was uh, disparaging toward. And ironically, of course, he's now on the Bank of England's 20-pound note, mm. <laughs> although he was a critic of the bank. Uh, but because it was uh, competitive and innovative, uh, the Scottish banking system was sort of the training ground for bankers in the 19th century, and Scottish bankers went throughout the world – setting up banks uh, because they had the most modern ideas on banking. Somehow I left Haggis off that list of great Scottish contributions. Uh, You're forgiven. Never had Haggis, but a lot of people swear by it. Um, A lot of people swear at it. Yeah, I think that's (laughs) probably true too. Uh, You said at the beginning of this conversation about free banking that it was politically um, unlikely to be a, a – it was a non-starter right now. And I, what I find interesting is there's probably never – right now, we're in, again, we're in January of 2010. I don't think there's ever been a time in America, recent American history where people were more hostile toward the whole concept of a central bank. Uh, it's a remarkable. Now, wh- whether it's justified or not, we don't need to get into that or not, but certainly politically – As good a time as any for Whether their alternative is better or not. Well, that's what I want to talk about for a minute. We'll close with this before we play the the rap song of Fear the Boom and Bust, uh, which is coming up shortly. I know our listeners are eagerly awaiting it, and I appreciate those of you who are not fast-forwarding the (laughs) the podcast and skipping our insights. Yes, thank you. Um, (laughs) We really appreciate that. Here's what I'm thinking about. You know, right now, Ben Bernanke's future is uncertain. He may be confirmed, it may not be confirmed. So one way to, quote, fix the Fed, which is the very common political fix of of America and every country, is to get the, quote, right person in the job. We just get the right person, which often neglects the incentives that that person faces when they're in the job, which certainly, in the case of Ben Bernanke, changed from, appear to have changed since when he was an academic to when he was a central banker. So the alternative strategy is to tinker with the rules of the the Fed and we're not going to talk about any particular legislation because we're, we're not um, we're not allowed to here at Econ Talk um, to talk about the the virtues of or vices of a particular uh, to advocate bill for any, before Congress. Yeah, exactly. So we're not going to talk about that. But but those are sort of the two standard ways. You you pick the better the right person, or you tinker with the the institution. You change its mandate a little bit and. Um, we had we had Michael Belanchi on here recently talking about how the Fed is sort of inherently going to be – it's going to be problematic for the, the Fed to both keep prices stable and employment growing. It's a, it's a, a difficult, maybe impossible task. 
Is there any politically viable small step we could make toward a free banking world without having to go there in one swoop? Is there any uh, way to open the door to banking competition and to reduce the monopoly power of the Fed? Or are we stuck trying to say, let's be like Scotland? Which is a hard sell politically for a policy to take well, a radical right. change. I, I mean, I think uh, Ben Bernanke's survival uh, turns on the fact that he has critics on both the left and the right, and they certainly are not going to agree on who should replace him. So he may emerge; uh, he probably will emerge as the compromise. Uh, but I think the in-trade prices are currently forecasting that he will be reappointed uh, or confirmed, I should say. Uh, I think there are some incremental steps we can take. I mean, but I mean, the reason I said earlier that I don't expect uh, free banking anytime soon is that it's kind of a strong version of placing a uh, a binding rule on the Fed, a, a pre-commitment to a particular path of policy, and I haven't seen much willingness to do that. So. The strong form of it, which is eliminate the central bank, uh, is even less likely. Uh, but, I mean, my hope would be that just as the monopoly of the postal system, of the U.S. postal uh, system, has become less relevant as private firms have been allowed to enter the market, right, they determined that uh, overnight, packages. Overnight, overnight letters delivered by FedEx or U, uh, United Parcel Service do not constitute an entrenchment on the uh, USPS's monopoly on first-class mail, so that monopoly has become less and less of a problem for on, consumers. Well, on innovation, email is the dominant destroyer of that monopoly. I'm hoping that uh, at the margin, innovation in payments mechanisms will give people access, easier and easier access, uh, to better forms of money, uh, and that that will help restrain central banks. And... There was some talk about that happening in the 1990s. In fact, uh, former Fed Governor Randy Krosner wrote a piece about how the decline in inflation during the late 80s and 90s was due to there being more competition on central banks and central banks having to worry about uh, losing their market share and therefore behaving more responsibly. So what I think we need to be on uh, – simply need to do is – Make sure there aren't legal restrictions against people putting their savings uh, in offshore bank accounts, in alternative currencies, uh, in precious metals if they want to. So give people those kind of options. And if the dollar becomes uh, more and more iffy, then people will be able to protect themselves by moving their wealth into uh, these other forms. Currently, there are... Uh, tax disadvantages to putting your money in precious metals. You have to pay capital gains taxes if your gold holds its value while the dollar drops because that's a rise in the dollar price of your gold and you get taxed on that even if you haven't made any real profit. Um, we've had a, a big increase in restrictions on money transfer services since 9-11, um, particularly in formal forms of money transfer, even though we now know that uh, the 9-11 uh, hijackers got their money through Western Union, <laughs> not through some sort of unlicensed uh, money transfer service. But can uh, I? But can those, I, those are the options we need to keep open. And it, there are all kinds of uh, innovations in payment mechanisms using chip cards, using Internet transfer that uh, you know, make offshore banking and alternative forms of banking much more readily accessible. But if I wanted to uh, – let's say you were going to uh, build me a house and I want to write a contract with you that I will pay you a certain amount of money when that house is finished. And instead of specifying it in dollars, I specify it in either uh, ounces of gold or kroner or pesos. Okay, or CPI indexed. Can we do that now? Is that legal? We can do that. So you'd think you'd see some – I mean, it's a, culturally, it would take some doing to get people used to that. But if the dollar got out of hand, if inflation did get out of hand, which is a worry, yeah, uh, the courts would enforce those contracts? Uh, well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I guess that's an open question. There was actually. Uh, but you wonder why it hasn't been. If, if it's a good idea, if a competition bank. There was an article it, in the AER <laughs> uh, by Hugh McCulloch in which he said these kind of contracts are now enforceable. Uh, but Thanks, you. That's good to know. <laughs> Could be true. But it would be a little well, bit. I hope it's true. Yeah, it would be a little bit. Of, but it seems to me that would be the. I'm also told that quietly the rules against commercial banks in the U.S. issuing currency have been repealed. Hmm. Now, I suppose no bank wants to stick its neck out and see what the Fed would actually do if it started competing with the Fed. But it would be entertaining, wouldn't it? It would. Well, I, in a minute, we're going to listen in a minute. And if, in, after uh, a brief uh, exit, thank you. We're going to be hearing Fear of the Boom and Bust, so please stay tuned. In the meanwhile, I want to thank Larry White for being part of EconTalk. Larry, thanks so much. Thanks, Russ. My pleasure. John Maynard Keynes. Oh, F.A. Hayek. Yeah, yeah, we're opposed. We're opposed. We oppose each other philosophically in the same studio. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play low interest no. rates. It's the animal spirits. John Maynard Keynes wrote the book on modern macro. The man you need when the economy's off track. Depression, recession, now your question's in session. Have a seat and I'll school you in one simple lesson. Boom, 1929, the big crash. We didn't bounce back, economy. Me's in the trash. Persistent unemployment, the result of sticky wages. Waiting for recovery? Seriously? That's outrageous. I had a real plan. Any fool can understand. The advice real simple. Boost aggregate demand. C I G all together gets to Y. Keep that total grow and watch the economy fly. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play low interest no, rates. It's the animal spirit. You see, it's all about spending here the register cha-ching circular flow the dough is everything so if that flow is getting low doesn't matter the reason we need more government spending now it's stimulus season so forget about saving get it straight out of your head like i said in the long run we're all dead savings is destruction that's the paradox of thrift don't keep money in your pocket or that growth will never live because business is driven by the animal spirits the bull and the bear and there's reasons to fear its effects on capital investment income and growth that's why the state should fill the gap with stimulus, both the monetary and the fiscal. They're equally correct. Public works, digging ditches, war has the same effect. Even a broken window helps the glass man have some wealth, the multiplier driving higher the economy's health. And if the central bank's interest rate policy tanks, a liquidity trap, that new money stuck in the banks. Deficits could be the cure you've been looking for. Let the spending soar now that you know the score. My general theory's made quite an impression. Revolution. I transformed the econ profession. You know me, modesty. Still, I'm taking a bow. So say it loud and say it proud. We're all Keynesians now. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. I made my case, Freddie H. Listen up, can you hear it? I'll begin in broad strokes, just like my friend Keynes. His theory conceals the mechanics to change. That simple equation, too much aggregation. Ignores human action and motivation Yet it continues as a justification For bailouts, payoffs, by polls with machinations You provide them with cover to sell us a free lunch Then all that we're left with is debt and a bunch If you're living high on that cheap credit hog Don't look for a cure from the hair of the dog Real savings come first if you want to invest The market coordinates time with interest Your focus on spending is pushing on thread In the long run, my friend, it's your theory so sorry there, buddy, if that sounds like invective Prepare to get schooled in my Austrian perspective We've been going back and forth for a century I want to steer markets I want them set free There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it Play low interest no, rates it's the animal spirit The place you should study isn't the bust It's the boom that should make you feel leery That's the thrust of my theory The capital structure is key Malinvestments wreck the economy The boom gets started with an expansion of credit the fed sets rates low are you starting to get it that new money is confused for real loanable funds but it's just inflation that's driving the ones who invest in new projects like housing construction the boom plants the seeds for its future destruction the savings aren't real consumption's up too and the grasping for resources reveals there's too few so the boom turns to bust as the interest rates rise for the cost of production 
and price signals were lies. The boom was a binge, that's a matter of fact. Now it's devalued capital that makes up the slack. Whether it's the late 20s or 2005, booming bad investments seems like they'd thrive. You must save to invest, don't use the printing press, or a bus will surely follow, an economy depressed. Your so-called stimulus will make things worse. Just more of the same, more incentives perverse. And that credit crunch ain't a liquidity trap, just a broke banking system. I'm done, that's a wrap. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play more interest no, rates. it's the animal spirits. The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>